Hey, what's up YouTube? What's going on? In today's new video, what I wanted to talk about is MRIs and their relationship to lower back pain. Now, the reason I wanted to have this discussion and make this video is because I've been getting a lot of emails recently about people just emailing me with help with regards to their lower back problems and people will send me their MRIs with whether that's the reports or just the images themselves as well. And they'll expect me to have some advice or recommendations for them. And while an MRI is fine and it provides information about the anatomy of an individual's spine, it doesn't really say much else to me and whether one can do certain movements pain-free, what their tolerance is like, what their capacity is like, and how they can actually function on a daily basis. So it's really hard for me to really provide any one advice based off just an MRI image or an MRI report. And that's why I do an assessment in terms of looking at an individual's movement patterns, what are their tolerance to things like sitting, bending over, and different sorts of exercises. So anyways, the point that I wanted to kind of make with that is that the problem with MRIs, or at least one problem with just kind of solely focusing on MRIs is that they're only giving you an image of an individual's anatomy, whether that's the low back, the knee, the shoulder, this could apply to any area of the body. And based off that, it's not exactly the best tool to indicate if one is suitable for exercise or activity. And one actually needs to see if one can do certain movements pain-free or not. Because the thing is, a lot of people have disc bulges, a lot of people have disc herniations, a lot of people have osteoarthritis in their low back, yet a lot of these individuals are pain-free and don't have any issues to begin with, even though an MRI may look horrible or it may look terrible. A lot of these people can actually function pretty good. And so that's one reason why just kind of relying on an MRI report isn't exactly the best thing or is really a good indication of what one can do or what one cannot do. And that's why, like I said, I need to look at how one moves and kind of functions on a daily basis and do they actually have pain or not, even though the MRI is terrible. So it's kind of one of the limitations I'd say with MRI images is just kind of, it's just, it's just an image of the anatomy. It doesn't really say much else, but the limitation really becomes just solely focusing on the MRI itself in terms of what a lot of radiologists may do. They just look at the MRI. This is what you have. And this is what you're causing your lower back problems when maybe it could be something else. Maybe it's related to their activities or movement patterns. So there's kind of the one limitation. That's why I can't really provide much advice to people who may just email me their MRI report or just kind of send me some information about their MRI because I really need to see how they move, what their posture is like, how they can tolerate exercise and what their daily routine is like to really give them some good recommendations. So that's one thing I just wanted to kind of mention. But the thing, another thing with regards to MRIs and kind of a flaw with them is that you're only getting an image of the anatomy of being in that certain position. So traditionally, most MRIs are taken in a supine position with someone lying on their back. You're not getting an image of someone lying on their stomach or sitting down or doing some sort of dynamic activity, maybe like walking. And the reason why this is problematic is because the anatomy changes based on the positions that we are in. So when we are in a supine position like on our back, we're in a decompressed state for the most part. Whereas if we were sitting down, we have now created more compression onto our lumbar spine. So the mechanics are going to change. Now we may create more of a disc bulge in a seated position. And that, in a sense, would give us maybe a better indication of what one's problem is or how the, maybe the, the disc is maybe moving into a nerve or whatnot. And just lying into a supine position may not give us the best indication. And this is also a reason why it's not the best idea to be comparing someone's MRI to another person's MRI because number one, we don't know the position that the MRI was taken in. Everyone's lumbar spine anatomy and mechanics are different. And everyone's kind of disc bulges, disc herniations, arthritis or end plate issues that may be going on are going to be different from each individual. And also the genetics and the physiology associated with the individual's body is also another factor at play as well, which is why it's not the best idea to compare your MRI to another person's MRI. Now, those are just some things I wanted to talk about with regards to MRIs and it's why exactly they're not the best kind of tool to solely rely on to really develop a program around. Yes, it gives us some information about the anatomy and it may just kind of reconfirm things that we may have saw from a movement assessment and just kind of give us some more details. Now, in terms of a strength and conditioning scenario though, I'll say this though. If I have access to one's MRI and someone's coming into a strength and conditioning program and maybe they've had a previous history of some lower back problems and maybe they have a disc bulge disc herniation, but they are asymptomatic and they come to me and I see this on their MRI. 
Knowing this from their MRI report gives me a good indication of how their exercise program should be structured because now that I know that they have the disc ball disc herniation, it is going to allow me to better structure the program into essentially program exercises that are not going to further cause that disc bulge or disc herniation to grow in size or to become symptomatic when it may be already symptomatic. So avoiding things like sit-ups or any sort of flexion under load, maybe any seated st uh, stretches that involve lumbar flexion, any kind of lumbar flexion would be probably pretty important to avoid for that individual's program because we don't, we don't want to make their symptoms worse or we don't want to make their injury worse. So having an MRI available can help provide some more information to someone like myself to actually know that. And this wouldn't just be applicable to the low back, but we could talk about the hip. Maybe some there's arthritis going on in the hip, so maybe we don't want to squat this individual. Maybe they have some issues going on the shoulder, whether that's maybe um, a labral tear or something in the shoulder, so maybe we don't do any overhead pressing with them. Really kind of depends, but that's just kind of maybe one of the benefits from actually having someone's MRI and kind of seeing what may be present with them and to kind of get their medical history background in order to provide the appropriate exercises for them and then also to kind of build up some capacity and also to maybe kind of structure things where they can perform or kind of maybe do some of those activities that they weren't able to do previously but now they can do them. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that though in terms of this video and I wanted to talk about MRIs because it's just something that has been coming up pretty recently with a lot of people emailing me about their MRIs just sending them to me and looking for some specific advice and it's hard to really for me to really give any advice just by looking at an image or to look at an MRI report and to really suggest what to do and what not to do when I, I haven't even seen the individual's posture movement or how they're performing certain exercises, what their daily routine is like. So that's all I just wanted to talk about in this video, guys, because the thing is when it comes to MRIs, people could have the worst looking MRIs, but they could still be pain-free. And it's kind of a little bit of a mystery as to why, but just for some suggestions, genetics can play a role, the physiology, around maybe the spinal disc and maybe the joints and the low back may all play a role as well and each individual's physiology is different. It could be just their movement patterns. Maybe they practice good movement on a daily basis. They know to avoid lumbar flexion under load specifically. They practice good spine hygiene and they just really take care of themselves. Maybe a good diet, nutrition, which can all contribute to why maybe they're pain-free even though they have a terrible looking MRI. Whereas on the other hand, someone could have maybe a, a, a bad MRI. Maybe it's not horrible but they're in severe pain. And maybe that individual just doesn't practice good movement patterns or good spine hygiene, and just really is doing a lot of the wrong things. And that's why they may be in pain as opposed to the other person. So it kind of gives you an indication that how important things like movement and practicing good spine sparing strategies on a daily basis are how important that is. So just wanted to touch on that in this video, guys. Just wanted to talk about that. Hopefully you guys found this video helpful. And if you have any questions, comments, anything you'd like me to address, please be sure to leave a comment below. And with that, we will wrap up this video. So I wish you guys all the best and a successful and productive day and take care.